and um, a challenge to serve on Senate. Mm -hmm. So, well, guess what? Jamie Edwards, who's normally completely brilliant, made the mistake of doing. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And so most of you know Amy Bryant and Neely Ann Shoecraft in our communications uh, division. Amy's also a fellow and over our AQ program and Neely Ann is our director. And we are pleased to have Jamie Edwards with us, who's our director of online learning. And so today they're going to be talking about building assessments to measure student growth and combat cheating. So we will go ahead and let them get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Valerie, so much for that introduction. And thank you to each of you for being with us today as we talk about building assessments to measure student growth and to combat cheating. And as we pause for a minute and think about starting the new semester, most of us really don't want to have to start thinking about students cheating already. But we know that sometimes students get overwhelmed, they get stressed, and they try to take the easy way out. And we want to give us some pointers today that we can incorporate into the work that we do to help us be able to combat cheating and to overcome the tendency to cheat so that great learning can occur. And so as we begin, what most of us probably already recognize are the different types of assessments that we can use. When we give projects, essays, and presentations, it does make it more difficult for cheating to occur because more work is required on the student. Now, that does not mean that cheating won't occur for those. I had a student who once delivered his entire speech with someone else's name and school in the top corner of every single PowerPoint slide that he presented. Very easy to see that cheating occurred. Now, cheating may not always be that blatant, but when we give students more ownership with open-ended assignments and assessments, it gives less opportunity for cheating to occur. We do know that many times, and depending on our subject, we need to offer tests. And when we offer quizzes and tests, there's lots of different types of questions that we can use. If you look at the list on the screen, if you start with open-ended questions, harder to cheat. It's easier for these type of cheatings to be caught because it requires the student to answer from their own knowledge without a prompt, without things to choose from. Short answer questions again, require the student knowledge or Google, which we can usually capture with the programs that we're gonna be talked about in just a few moments. Multiple choice questions aren't bad, but we recognize that when we start using multiple choice and true false, it can lead to students being able to cheat easier. And so what we want to do today is to talk about the different types of assessments we're using and give some tr tips and tricks to help us make cheating harder for students. So when we're building our assessments, I know that you've heard it multiple times already in the past week, but please tilt. Tilt your projects, tilt your essays, tilt your presentation assignments. Give students the purpose, the reason the knowledge and skills that they're gonna develop and connect it to their futures. One of the favorite things that I do on my welcome to this class survey that I give students is I ask them for what their future careers are, what the careers are that they're currently working in. And that way, when we review those presentations, when we review these projects, I talk about how their careers are going to use the skills that they're learning. And so it creates connection to the real world that exists outside the classroom. With tilts and quizzes, consider tilting the instructions or the descriptions for the test or quiz. How many questions are there? How long are you giving them to take the test or quiz? If you're not allowing students to go back and forth, if it's an online quiz, tell them that that once they save a question and move to the next page, they won't be able to go back for review. And as we get ready to start the semester, teach them about how to take the test. It may be you do a course syllabus quiz 
or a course syllabus test the first day that just gets them in the habit of seeing what your tests are going to look like. It can be a way for them to have a chance, a draft per se, even if there's a little bit of points taken to it so that they can have a reason for doing it, it allows you to teach them how the tests are going to work. And so as we keep going, when we tilt those instructions and descriptions, what's the why? So, um, and I'm going to jump in there and talk. Um, oh, and again, I know you all have heard tilt a lot, but this is about combating the cheating, but also about really measuring student growth and helping students feel like what they're learning, what they're being assessed on is valuable. So, uh, you know, it's not just about the cheating part. It's about how can we decrease the cheating and then also make the learning process more valuable, or it, whether it's assessment through projects, assignments, testing, quizzing, whatever. So the why, as Amy said, what is the why? Why is it valuable? Um, whether it's specifically connected to a chapter, a course objective, a specific process that they need to learn in your program. Again, I know everybody uses different language depending on what they're teaching, but there should still always be a why. And that why lets them know the value of it and also what it connects to not only specifically within the course, but then also externally. Describe what materials being covered. You all know this seems obvious, but I, I know at least for myself, the longer I teach, the easier it is to default to thinking students know what I'm talking about. I, if you're giving a quiz, you're giving a test, what content is it over? How many chapters, which part of the chapter? Uh, that doesn't mean we're making it easier on them in terms of they still have to learn the material, but sometimes we cover a great deal more material than what's actually going to be tested. Uh, it, it, I, don't, I know in my class, if I tested over everything that we talked about or read about in the, in the textbook, I mean, the test would be three hours. Uh, so really, what is it that they need to focus on? And so much, de as much detail as you can give about what the test will look like. If you say multiple choice and short answer, if your test is done, tell them it's 50 multiple choice. It's eight short answer questions. One of the short answer questions is more valuable. It's going to be worth 15 points. I try and give them as much information as possible so that they feel more comfortable, but also that they're prepared and they know how to spend their time. So, for example, on the short answer question that's 15 points, I tell them about it ahead of time, but then also then I can remind them on test day, remember, Question number one, short answer, that's 15% of your grade. So you might want to go to that question first. But again, we want to make them as comfortable as possible and give them as much information as possible so they feel prepared, like they can do the test or assessment or whatever it is. Uh, Amy mentioned this a little bit, uh, and it, it, as far as the testing window due date, number of attempts, you all, whether it's online or in person, obviously that's going to be different as far as what information you share. But even if it's in the classroom, I, if I don't think about it, I might assume if I said, you know, if they know the test is next Thursday, in my mind, I know they have the whole class period. They may not know that. They're a new student, they're nervous. They might literally all week be thinking, do I have half an hour? Do I have 40 minutes? If it's the whole class period, let them know. You've got the whole class period. If it's online, what is the testing date you have from this date to this date to take it? Can you take it more than once? As Amy mentioned, can you go back to questions? The research shows it is helpful to let them go back and forth between questions, but if for some reason you're not going to let them do that, put it down in writing. Let them know ahead of time. Again, we want them to feel confident, <clears throat> make progress with this growth that we want them to have. This, uh, I think, is a great reminder because students want to know when they get their grade. <laughs> and again, we might know in our mind, well, I'm going to work on these this weekend and get them back Tuesday. Verbalize it. Even if you feel confident in your abilities to get your grading done, put it in your syllabus. How quickly will the turnaround be for assignments, tests, quizzes? It might be different for, might be longer for projects, but letting them know ahead of time what they can expect. Uh, this also will cut down on the amount of emails and phone calls you get asking, <laughs> where's my grade? Uh, but to me, so important. And I know it's hard because we run short on time in classes, but Review the assessment for a clear understanding of the material before moving forward. So if somebody gets their test back and it's a 75, they can look at it and see, okay, I missed that, but take time in class to go through that material, especially if you know quite a few of your students missed it. If you find that you 
are running short on class time, say I'm going to hold a Zoom session, log in. We can go over the test. I'll be happy to go through all the answers and talk to you about that so you feel confident with the course material. Uh, so, and again, I know for me that's something that's easy to leave out when I'm running short on time. But again, if they get the question wrong and they don't know what the right answer is, there's a really good chance that's going to impact their understanding of the course concepts that are coming after that. At least I know in our communication classes, a lot of those concepts build on each other. So we want to make sure they have that understanding. Something else uh, we want to think about is when we're building questions for the test or quiz, I know short answer slash essay, whatever you want to call them, or anywhere in between, they take more time, you all. We know that. They take more time to grade. Early on in my career, I did all short answer essay tests, and I'm surprised I'm still teaching after doing that because it took forever. Um, but so I realized I couldn't keep doing all of it that way. But so now I go through my content and I really think about what are the application based questions? What do I really want them to know? What are the biggest takeaways from this unit? And I make those my short answer questions because that's they're going to have to use critical thinking. Uh, and a lot of times it's examples, uh, explanations from their own life. So they're applying that course concept. So again, you're connecting it back to the why. Uh, and of course you can set up multiple choice questions that still encourage critical thinking, uh, but I do think your open-ended questions are going to allow for more critical thinking and definitely again, less cheating. It's hard to Google uh, or harder, I would say, when it needs to be specific examples from your own life. Practical suggestion, and I'm going to show you the slides where you can find this, but if you need detailed help, um, <clears throat> I'll help, but really Jamie is your person for all the technology D2L stuff, but you all, one of the easiest things that we can do in, if you're using D2L for quizzing, is we can randomize the questions in the order that the questions come in, and we can also randomize the answers. Um, now I'm going to show you what that slide looks like, a slide that shows you what that looks like. I do want to say if you're randomizing the answers, if you've got questions that are all of the above, uh, don't click that button because if that randomizes to A and it says all of the above, that's not going to work out well uh, for the students. It's going to be a little confusing. But if you just want to shuffle the quiz questions, literally when you are doing your quiz, you go to edit quiz and there's this little button right here. It says shuffle quiz questions. That's literally all you have to click. And you all, again, technology is not my area of expertise. So if I can do it, I promise when I say it's easy, it really does mean it's easy. Uh, as far as the answers, if you want the answers to come in a different order, that's going to be specific to the question. So when you go in and add or edit questions, you cl click on a specific question. And again, all you have to do is click this little box that will randomize the order. So. That does help a lot that and with the questions if people are taking online classes and they're trying to just take a quiz together on the phone or whatever, their questions are going to be in different orders and their answers are going to be in different orders, different order. And if they've got a time limit on that, at least I know in our class, we have a time limit, they're not going to be able to go through and do all that match all that up and at least as successfully cheat so that will at least cut down on some of it. So. Those are some suggestions. I'm gonna let Amy share a little bit more about test quiz questions. We dip into the land of psychology. You can also ask your students to sign an honor pledge before they start taking an assessment, whether it's a quiz, a test, project, and prime them with the idea of ethical standards. And so if you ask students to pledge that they're not going to get help, that they're going to do their own work, that they will work individually on this assignment, then it reminds students and predisposes them to act ethically. And there's research studies upon research studies that show by adding an honor pledge to assessments, students are less likely to cheat. And so one simple step that we can use is just to remind students before each quiz, or add it as a question on your quiz to say, I'm gonna promise not to cheat on this. Gracie, I see your hand, go ahead. I'm sorry, no, this is great. And, and I do something similar, but I know I teach at a different campus. I've had problems where, not problems, okay. I've had situations where students have actually come to me when I've handed this out and told me that in their faith, they are honor bound and ethically bound to aid anyone who asks them for help. 
So is there a language I can use? Because I mean, I've managed to muddle my way through trying to explain that that doesn't work here and you will, you know, suffer consequences without, you know, also trying to be tactful and be, you know, not violate a very strong belief system. Is there a language? Um, does anybody know that I could be more efficient at explaining the ethics in the classroom and the, the, the policies of the college have to be followed separate of faith-based? Do you see what I'm trying to say? I think Gracie, focusing on the individualistic grades. Our, as collectivists, we can study together. We can work together as we study, as we prepare for the test, but the test measures your individual progress in this class. And as a result, I need as the instructor to know where you are. And as a result, we can't help each other on this portion of the test. We can help each other study. We can help each other review answers for the test after all the tests have been handed back so that we can do better next time. But this is your individual chance to know where you are and how you can improve. And for me to know where you are to be able to move forward. And as a result, while we're taking this test, we don't get to ask for help from each other. Okay. The help portion came before the time to take it. Okay. We have okay. lots of good things popping up in the chat and I don't want to move past those. Yeah, it's Help good. does not include harming someone by keeping them from learning. Well, Are they, they don't actually... understand that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think defining what help means, defining the difference between studying and helping and where we are individually at this point. We all want every student to succeed. We believe that every student in our class will succeed, but success doesn't come from not doing the work that needs to be done. And possibly we even, want to hinder others' abilities. Um, and possibly even in instructions that you're giving out, listing these are positive examples of help, assisting, these are unacceptable ways of helping so that it gives them more concrete things. Because again, sometimes it might even feel like they're not doing anything wrong. But if it's in writing where they see, okay, this is allowed or this is helpful, this is positive in this learning environment. Uh, you know, that might help. I, I don't know. I agree with you, Gracie. It's a complicated topic. If you haven't read Connie's quote from Shel Silverstein in the chat, please, please do. We want the help that's good. We don't want the help that doesn't help others as we move through. So let's talk about building our questions. We want to build questions of complexity. I tell my students that if all they do is memorize what's on the slide, they will fail my test because that's a foundation and I want them to be able to know how to use it, what it means, how to apply it all the way through. And so you want to aim for high understanding. And one of my favorite things that we can add to our quizzes is justifying their answers. Even if it's a multiple choice question, ask them afterwards, why is this the correct answer? What reasoning did you use to choose this? Now, if we're doing that, it does add time to our test taking. So notice that. But when we ask students to justify their answers, it's not just saying A, B, C, D, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, that one. We're saying, let's take this deeper. Why did we choose this? So that we understand one, their thought process, and two, that they're actually understanding it. If you're not using a lockdown browser, you can tell students, go find a source. As you're going through this, as you're answering, I want you to cite your sources to the questions and the answers that you're giving us. And so even if it's a multiple choice question, ask for a source for it beyond simply Google told me and allow them to do the research behind the questions that are there. I asked you earlier why. I really think asking our students why is helpful. 
And it doesn't always have to be the why question of justifying. You could also ask, how can you use this in your future career? Based on the question above, name two ways you're going to use this in your future when you're in the workplace. If students aren't making the connection between knowledge and future, let's help them bridge the gap and put it on the test and ask them. How can you use this when you are going to work? How will knowing this help you when you go in for your job interview? Why do you think the other answers are incorrect? And have them explain their thought process that goes behind it. And as we know, especially if the tests are online, set your release of feedback for students to occur after the testing window closes. Now, it causes a delay. It makes it where students don't immediately get to see the right answers. But it also helps prevent cheating because if one person's taking it early so that they can let everybody else in the class know what the answers are, if we limit that, it's harder for the students to be able to get there. And we're going to let you know that online learning has so many wonderful, wonderful, wonderful programs. And so we want to give Jamie plenty of time to preview those and to let you know about the sessions that are coming later this week where you can learn more about those in depth. So Jamie, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you, sir. Jamie, you're on mute. There we go. So everything I said was really important and I don't know, no, I'm just kidding. Um, thank you, uh, Neelan and Amy. I agree with everything you kind of said so far. So I created my portion. Uh, we might cover some of the same kind of topics because we're all in the same ballpark, but I will cover the tools and technologies that we uh, also support here at Nashville State. Um, just so, I wanted to approach this from a research perspective. There was a, uh, a survey conducted by Wiley um, in May 2020 that stated that 93% of instructors think students are more likely to cheat online than in person, um, which was, it, it was a, a really, this is a really big number. And I'm like, that many instructors think they're cheating online. And another surprising stat from that survey was that only 30, only a third of the instructors said they were using some type of proctoring or service to prevent that cheating, um, which we, at National State, we do have uh, at least three tools that will help uh, prevent cheating in both writing assignments and testing. Um, so sometimes you have to figure out why do students cheat? So in many cases, they may you know lack confidence or have poor study skills, poor time management. It could be due to laziness or boredom, which has to do with some kind of time management or study skills. Um, they may be pressured to make good grades, so they're really terrified of failing an, an assessment. Um, they just may come from stressful environments, or there's just open opportunities to cheat, which students may think that the instructor doesn't care, and we all know that isn't the case. So in that Wiley report, um, there are some suggestions on uh, discouraging cheating. So one was to clarify the purpose of the assignment, and we we all know about tilt. So understanding what the students need to do and why they why they need to do it uh, is very important. In online in the online courses, um, usually there's a there's some dissonance or disconnect between communication of the instructor and the student. So increasing that instructor presence. Um, in a course and really encouraging a teacher to, uh, to student interaction will help students feel more connected. Um, you can do this by, you know, promoting lecture videos or holding um, Zoom sessions with your students if you want to take advantage of your office hours just to, to just to meet with your students. 
um, occasionally or even in the mid semester just to kind of um, ask how they're doing in the course and how they feel about their their workload and, and how they're keeping up so far. Um, creating your own test question pools. Um, so you can create pools within uh, D2L. And I know a lot of publishers have a lot of test pools as well. So you can randomize, you can create test pools for chapters. So if you wanted to have a chapter one quiz and you had a potential of 50 questions you could ask, but the test only has 20 questions for the students to take, you can randomize those questions. So every student gets a unique version. So it's, it's more unlikely that they're able to cheat off each other. Um, using shorter, more frequent practice tests to get the students to refine their approaches and get used to the, the testing without the, the pressure uh, of having to get a test perfect every single time. So allowing students to retake quizzes um, and using open book exams, um, which may test for higher levels of learning, but maybe add shorter time limits. So um, if you have a, a, a midterm exam and you allow open textbook, um, maybe make it shorter where they're not able to physically use the textbook to answer every single question. Or you can stray away from less summative testing and, and put more application of research or, or a project so something tangible can be taken away. Um, because uh, project-based learning is, is really more authentic than, you know, uh, than most testing options. Um, and just kind of continuing on this trend, how instructors can be proactive against cheating. So de-emphasizing the grades. So adding more formative quizzing or draft submissions of papers for feedback and improvement. So um, kind of the goal in, in the way I teach my students is I don't expect all my students to get it right the first time. I want them to learn from their mistakes and add opportunities for feedback. Um, I also tend to focus on expertise and mastery. So reinforcing uh, the goals of the course or the learning objectives of the course and in encouraging more critical thinking exercises or even critical thinking test questions. Um, creating uh, combat boredom with relevance. So allowing students to find relevance in what they're learning, allowing them to be creative in some of the courses um, in adding uh, various types of assignments, not just typical discussions, but maybe adding case studies or add, adding some, uh, some projects or research assignments they're interested in, re in, in doing. Um, encouraging the ownership of learning. So providing meaningful choices. Um, is important to some. So if students are allowed to choose research topics of interest or adding flexibility and time it takes to master content or introducing ideas like gamification, um, sometimes these can be um, external motivators and that can curtail cheating. And just building confidence. So uh, we've talked about tilt, but allowing your students to understand what is expected of them. Um, because if you don't make your expectations clear to your students, they will never understand your expectations. So we have uh, the supported tools we have primarily um, at Nashville State is Turnitin for plagiarism detection, and then online proctoring tools. We have Honor Lock and Respondus Lockdown with Monitor now. Um, so Turnitin is an originality checker. Uh, it's play, it detects plagiarism um, based on textual similarities and other resources from the web or previous submissions. Um, it, it does have a database that it stores uh, previous submissions of, of content. It generates an originality score for the assignments. Um, and also supplies instructors with a line by line similarity report. So you can use Turnitin as a formative tool to allow students to submit uh, papers first to see what it flags for plagiarism. Um, and then allow them to address that those, those flags on their own. And so they're not pressured to both turn it in for the grade and also turn it in to try to avoid plagiarism because there's different types of plagiarism, some intentional, some unintentional. And some of it has to do with, you know, uh, bad writing skills or uh, bad paraphrasing skills, things of that nature. So allowing them opportunities to, uh, to learn upon their own mistakes. And it could be done through uh, the originality checker. That's very, very helpful from a student perspective. 
And then we also have Honor Lock and Respondus Lockdown Browser. So these are two proctoring tools. They're very similar in the way they work. We just have access to both of them currently. So Honor Lock of remote proctors, uh, student testing, and flags potential acts of uh, academic dishonesty for instructors to review. So, uh, and the Respondus Lockdown Monitor with Monitor does the same thing. They both um, record the student taking the test and records their screen. And um, I'll get to I'll get to some details there, in, in just in just a minute. So I'll, we'll first cover turn it in. So um, three main uses of turn it in is a using as a deterrent against plagiarism. Uh, provides a report to help I can identify the occurrences of plagiarism. So both the student and the instructor can can see those flags. And, you know, it, it uh, helps the student identify and correct possible occurrences of plagiarism. So it's, a, it's, it's meant to, if you use it as a tool to improve student work, um, that's really what it's meant for. Uh, submitted work provides two uh, identifiers, the similarity index and an originality report. So the similarity index indicates the percentage of the paper that Turnin has identified as being matched against other sources. So it could look into Google and based on line by line, it can identify potential sources. And also um, the originality report shows the, more, the matches in more detail. So it can be websites, books, journals, articles. It'll look for everything within a wide database. So Turnitin is, it does its best work for direct word-to-word -word copy, but it's not perfect. So uh, you may have to take a look individually as instructors to see what it's actually flagging, and then you can determine whether it's plagiarism or not. Uh, it may detect inappropriate paraphrasing or so-called mosaic plagiarism. So students can take an idea or concepts that are not of their own, but merely change the wording of the text. Uh, but it is a helpful tool. So identifying what it flags and in, in showing students and going over it with them of what they need to improve on in their writing, uh, this tool is a great component for that. And this is just a good quote, is like, there's a substantial benefit to using Turnitin as an education writing tool rather than a punitive tool. And student learning outcomes can be significantly improved and the process becomes a learning curve to acquire academic writing skills. And I've been using, or promoting Turnitin for uh, probably a decade now. And it, it is really a useful tool. Now, if you're not in, in Turnitin is really meant for research papers or, or larger writing assignments, um, but you can use them for uh, smaller writing assignments too. You can't really use them for discussions or, or testing. So adding transparency to your courses uh, with Turnitin, so you can link to the student academic policy um, or incorporate that into your syllabus quiz or your, uh, hopefully this is in your syllabus, uh, linking students to helpful resources to define plagiarism um, or resources on scholarly writing to help, you know, what, what they should look out for or how they should handle, you know, quotes versus paraphrasing and then, uh, the library has great um, guides on avoiding plagiarism. Um, and also informing your students that their work be turned in, checked by turn it in in advance of a due date, and then how explain to them how you want them to use this tool to improve their writing before a final submission. And then you know, allowing them to submit multiple drafts is always um, is always good. So where is Turnitin located inside D2L? So if you go to uh, an assignment or create an assignment, there's, there's a couple of steps here to how to do that. Uh, but if when you go to create an assignment um, and evaluation and feedback, if you expand that column, Turnitin is the button located uh, below. So you would probably need to develop an assignment first and then associate it with Turnitin inside the Dropbox. So, uh, I'm not going to go over each step, um, but I will share the information and tutorials and resources um, at the end. So expanding that option, um, you get these grade marks. So you can kind of set the, establish the settings of what you want Turnitin to look for to how you want to use it. Um, 
Now, if you want to learn more about Turnitin um, or set a consult with one of the instructional designers, feel free to contact our office. We'll kind of walk you through when you're ready. I don't expect everyone to be a master of learning the settings of Turnitin currently, but we have resources and then you can also contact us and we can, we can help you get those set up. Jamie, yes. make, sure, make sure you tell folks or show folks, well, you've already gone past it. There is a certain button that has to be activated in order for students to see the similarity score. Yes. And I've, I'm already doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It has really kind of changed the quality of what I'm getting. Totally support your ideas here. Right. Yeah. These are in the, in the, the advanced settings. So you'll see a more options and turn it in. And you can allow the similarity reports and the types of, of submissions um, you would like it to generate. So um, it gets a little bit more complicated the more settings you go, but there's turn it has some great resources and there's always little question marks at the end of each thing. So it, it kind of describes what each option means. So um, we can definitely help you help you get set those up just uh, trying to define how you want to use turn it in. Jamie, Gracie has her hand up. Gracie, sure. go ahead with a question. Uh, no, what Karen was talking about, I would love to be able to do that because I actually use this for some of their lab assignments. Mm -hmm. But on, I noticed on this screen, and I've, I've encountered this myself when I was trying, the box for allow students to view similarity reports isn't highlighted. We couldn't select it. So do you know why? Like, I'm wow. looking at it right now. Like, hmm. I, I don't know why I'll have to, maybe I'll, ch I can check your course and see if there's. Well, I mean, reason. it's highlighted on your screen. I mean, it's not, not highlighted. Did you check the enable originality check for this yeah. folder? Mm -hmm. hmm. So is that uh, what's missing here? Because his is checked too, and it's still not lit up. You, I, I'm mine, looking... when I check that, usually refreshes and then allows me to check that box. Oh, OK. I haven't been that patient. I'll do that. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Okay, well, good. That's where we're answering questions about Turnitin. And we also, we're creating, we're redeveloping our website information for online learning um, as we're also transitioning to a, a new platform. But uh, I do have a link um, to how to use Turnitin in D12. And uh, this link is inside of our presentation. So we'll be able to share this information. And Scott, we try to do step-by-step -step with images on a walkthrough of how to uh go through each step within d2l of our own d2l and just explaining what everything means so uh i'm not going to go over this right here because it's it's it can get really complex because there's so many options in there but i encourage you to kind of play with the idea of using turn it in and uh just and then once you've kind of introduced yourself to it you can always come to us and ask questions or use our, use our resources for help so uh, any questions on turn it in? All right. And no worries, I'll, we'll, I'll be able, I'll be available this week and next week. We'll, we'll be able to answer any questions you may have uh, later as well. Uh, so let's go to move to online proctoring. Um, so looking at the, like maybe the top eight reasons to use online proctoring, um, it locks down the testing environment. So if you're, if you develop a test and you want students to take the test and be honest about it, um, being able to lock down that environment is very helpful. Uh, and also being able to record students taking a test is very helpful as well. Uh, we have both proctoring services are integrated within D2L. It blocks application switching. So the lockdown browser doesn't allow students to go to open up a new website unless you specifically add the website they can go to. Uh, it protects exam questions, so they can't print or they can't share uh, those questions. Increases faculty confidence in online testing. Um, it's available in multiple formats, so students with Macs or uh, PCs can take it. And some, uh, I know Monitor allows um, iPads to be able to, to be used to take tests. It's just a different setting. Um, and as an instructor, basically, it's easy to set up. So you really just need to worry about the setup of how you want to have your exams proctored and then maybe allow the students to a practice test or something using uh, Respondus or Honor Lock um, to allow them, so there's no issues of them testing from their device. 
uh, and vendors have extensive training materials and resources. So not only are we a resource for Honor Lock, um, but they support their own products. They have uh, help desk and people in uh, chat boxes ready to answer any questions you may have. Um, the problem where we can help will set up, but once a test is ongoing, uh, we don't really have an, a, students can't really contact us to help them with the proctored test that is currently going on because everything is locked down. So that's the limitations of we can't, once a, pro, once a test is being proctored, um, the lockdown process is enabled. So we, we really don't have any uh, access to uh, aid students in that way. Uh, but we do encourage you to explain to students if they have issues, um, to contact or email you immediately, um, just saying if the power goes out or if their internet crashes or their computer is set on fire, whatever the case may be, you need to prompt them, your students to say, if they have problems, they need to notify uh, you via email um, immediately, just so you can either have it reset or, or whatever needs to happen. So both Honor Lock and Monitor have required startup sequence. So this helps with authentication. Uh, students are less likely to cheat if they know they're being recorded. Recordings are available for instructor review and can be uh, accessed within the course. Um, before the exam even starts, instructors can add the following startup sequence. So you can check and see if the, the, the webcam is recording, the screen is recording, the audio is recording. You can ask students to take a picture or hold up a photo ID for authentication. So uh, you can see um, who who is taking the test and having a picture of the student. So uh, you can verify that's the, the actual student is taking the test. You can ask for a room or desk scan. So you can ask them to move the uh, the camera to scan their their surroundings. You can implement use of calculators. You can disable printing and web browsing, allow specific URLs. And you can even and the software is set up so it disables the test if the camera cannot recognize the user. So if I'm in frame right now and if I move out of frame, the test will stop and until until the face is back in and recognized, then the test begins again. So before using the proctoring tools, you will need to create or import an exam into D2L. So you can't create a an exam using Honor Lock or Respondus. That's not how that works. Now we do have a Respondus 4.0 test builder, which is a separate product by the same company, which you can you have access to to build tests. But a test needs to be inside D12 before enabling Honor Lock or Respondus. Due to the cost per exam, Honor Lock should not be used for all quizzes, only for the larger exams, because the cost differential is different from the products. Respondus is set by per class use with unlimited exams. So. Um, an example is Honor Lock will charge per exam, so per seat. So if you have a midterm and final, that's two charges that are charged to the school. Um, with Respondus, if you, you implement one Respondus exam in your class, that's just one flat fee, but you, the, there's no fee for unlimited exams. So if you use more than one exams, you can, if you want to proctor quizzes, you can because there's no penalty for the number of exams inside um, a class. Uh, so if you require, if you will require online students to take a remotely proctored exam using Honor Lock or Respondus Lockdown Browser or Respondus Monitor, um, you should identify which software you're using, any hardware requirements, including if they need a, a, a computer, a camera, microphone, um, and support services, uh, and try to put that information in the syllabus at the beginning of the semester. Um, there are suggested syllabus verbiage for both Honor Lock and Respondus. Um, there's links there, uh, and we can provide and help with that language as well. So we have uh, a new web, web page for proctoring inside the online learning. So uh, I'm just kind of share some of the information here um, on that, but that resource is widely available as well. Uh, so basically, there's four steps to setting up a proctored exam. So Honor Lock, uh, it's integrated within D2L. You don't have to download any additional software um, as an instructor. And first, create your exam, build your test like you normally would, um, enable Honor Lock for the exam. And, and there's methods to these instructions, uh, creating a practice exam, 
um, Honor Lock does have its own specific practice exam that you could download and upload to your course. Um, we really recommend if you use uh, a practice exam, do it that way because it will charge if you just try to create your own practice exam. Um, and then you can, once the exam is completed, you can review the results of your exam um, through the Honor Lock uh, button. To enable this button, you have to go through some, some other steps. Um, and I, Honor Lock does, was specifically used by some departments. And I think we have a wider range of availability. Um, but uh, you have to, you'd have to contact uh, online learning if you want to add an Honor Lock button to your course. So Respondus Lockdown Browser, you don't need to add a, another button. Uh, Respondus Lockdown Browser is already enabled inside uh, the testing feature. So what we've done this, this semester is we've always had Lockdown Browser, but now we've enabled Monitor. So Monitor is the, the ability to record the students taking the exam and uh, allow instructors to uh, review those recordings and it also flags. So I wanna make sure that if you ever, if, if you receive any flags from uh, either of these services, you don't have to watch the entire video of them. There are thumbnails where you can kind of walk through these flags and kind of determine whether or not students are cheating or not. In some cases, most cases, they're not. It's just more of like, they may have coughed and they have turned away. They may have, you know, done something to enable a flag, but um, the, the flags are there just for your uh, review. Uh, and basically, it's a similar kind of setup with Respondus, just a four-step process. So if you plan to use either service, just ensure that you know your students know that they, the exams will be proctored, um, provide them with the proper resources and support, and we have all that information you can copy and paste. Uh, define the software and hardware you expect your students to use. We also have that information. And then identify what students need to know before taking a proctored exam location, devices, materials, time, question types, et cetera. So do we have any questions about proctored exams? There are two questions in the chat. Karen was asking for the link for the syllabus language for Honor Lock, if we could drop that in the chat. Mm -hmm. And then Karen asked, does the exam have to be in D2L? They use Connect for their exams. Yes, to use these services, they have the exams have to be in D2L. And Gracie also and had Gracie, to. I just saw your hand up. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but go ahead, Gracie. Oh, my question is, I used um, Honor Lock la uh, last semester, mm -hmm. um, and I had a student in AMP1 whose father works for cybersecurity for the state, mm -hmm. and I actually got to speak with him directly on the Zoom because she refused to use the Honor Lock. Her, her dad had read all the fine print and said it was too aggressive in its information gathering. Okay. And so I, the, the thing was at the time, the only response I had, I mean, I had to make alternate arrangements for her because I didn't know, do we have an official policy for when students say, no, I don't want to use honor lock. Yes, uh, we do have uh, an official policy. So students do have an option to opt out of using either honor lock or respondus, and then they would go through the testing center. So um, let me and uh, that information just got uh, sent out yesterday by Dr. Roberts. So if you check your email, you may see something related to that. That has all the policies and uh, information needed. Um, sorry, my computer is like wanting to restart. I'm like, no, stop. Um, so let me share these links inside the, the chat and uh, I'll share the link to um, my presentation and then all the links. If you want a specific link, just let me know and I'll, I'll add it to the chat. So that's that's my part of the presentation. We have about 10 minutes left, so I can turn it back over to, to Amy or Neely Ann. Um, and if you have questions about proctoring, you can also contact online learning and we can help you uh, answer anything you may have. Let's open the floor for comments, questions. Anyone who would like to, please go ahead. I'll, I'll go ahead and stop recording as well. That way, um, if people have questions, they don't record it, want recorded, <laughs> that it's not. <laughs>